In my youth, I was seen by the world as the artist, the dancer, the violinist. Each art form flowed into the other, almost indistinguishable in my head, and seemed to characterize every thought and motion I entertained. The performing arts taught me quite a few lessons along the way. Tireless sessions with my violin taught me mental discipline and precision. Yet I also learned how to find expressiveness amid the strict technique violin demands. Dance taught me practice, patience, and competition. I had to learn how to take care of myself both physically and emotionally. Over my decade of classical training, I had the opportunity to perform on world-renowned stages and even on film sets. It was a fast-paced, competitive life, but every second I spent on stage was exhilarating. But alongside the artist, a second being lived inside of me, and she was curious, meticulous, and fascinated by the scientific and mathematical principles that explain and govern life. My love for science and reasoning was intimate. I play a large part of my public persona, but every day in grade school I would eagerly await science class because each time I discovered how much more I had left to learn, and I was eager to know what role I was meant to inhabit. I was inspired that science could make me feel infinitesimally small, like a speck floating in the abyss of the universe, and also a giant as I learned about technologies on the nanoscale. I thought about how for millennia, engineers have learned how to manipulate the external environment to improve life. But only, only in a recent sliver of scientific history have we had the knowledge and skills to engineer our internal environment with an ambitious goal, improving the mechanism of life itself. At Georgia Tech, very few of my peers see me as a dancer or a violinist. Now I'm an archetype biomedical engineering student, obsessed with research and planning to pursue a graduate degree. Coming to a technical school like Georgia Tech, I was scared that dance and violin would have a diminished presence in my life. And it's true, I do spend fewer hours at the ballet bar or in a practice room with my violin. But strangely enough, I have started to notice elements of my performing arts background where I didn't expect to see them. As in dance, research requires practice and patience. Like in violin, research mandates strict technique and also creativity. Even the biological nature of my work has started to inspire me in an artistic way. From the orchestrated molecule exchange in a cell signaling pathway, to the intricate dynamics of an entire organism, every system is uniquely fine-tuned. I've also had the chance to play around with some fluorescent microscopy, and this has produced some of the most colorful, vibrant, vivid, and out-of-this-world images that I truly started to see as art. And on the other end of the spectrum, I've started to experience science when I perform. There are no words to explain the truly visceral and multidimensional state of performance, where my mind is caught between musicality, physicality, and character. I have to see dancing with a physics lens because I have to physically feel my center of gravity. I have to think about torque and moments to find balance. And I have to consider friction turning. I also have to be aware of the geometries I create, both as an individual performer and as a part of an ensemble. And as you can imagine, violin also requires some scientific thinking. Beyond playing the instrument and reading music, it requires active counting, thinking about resonance, and considering different material qualities, such as bow hair, rosin, string types, all which change sound and do their part to improve performance. Seeing the world through these lenses of art and science is empowering. But the truth is, integrating art and science is not easy and seamless. In fact, at a place like Georgia Tech, where we have these hierarchies of majors, interests, and professions, Thinking with an interdisciplinary approach is especially difficult. I have felt this disconnect ever since I set foot on this campus, and I'm sure many of you have as well. So bear with me as we do a little experiment. If you have ever performed on a stage, played an instrument, um, taken a picture you're proud of, or simply doodled something in a class that you're bored, raise your hand. So we have so many artists here in this room, it's amazing. <laughs> 
And now, if you have been involved in academic research, have taken apart a pen and put it back together, or looked at something and tried to figure out how it works, raise your hand. This artist-scientist duality is present in all of us, but the majority of people only capitalize on one of their personas. But what if we could learn to do both, to think in different ways and to expand our imaginations? Over the past summer, I had the unique opportunity to partner with a nonprofit to develop neural networks that learn the style of street artists and create new art in the form of murals. For me, this was an exciting opportunity to take skills I learned in my computing and engineering classes to make art for the public. However, I believe there's a much more important reason that you and I need to pay attention to the relationship of art and science. And it lies in the fundamental need to communicate science. Research is meaningless if the results don't make it past the bench. Likewise, if only a select group of experts are capable of understanding or even appreciating it, that work loses a magnitude of its power to impact people. But art is one of those forms of communication which transcends languages and formulas and our levels of education. So let's take a look at how art can transform science. Bioengineers from Caltech designed this Mona Lisa out of DNA. Yep, you heard right. This is DNA. To demonstrate a powerful nucleotide self-assembly mechanism based on a fractal algorithm. That past sentence was full of a lot of jargon that maybe only a small niche of engineers can understand. But the important thing is that these researchers were able to make a connection with every single one of you in this room and millions more people around the world. And that is powerful. Suddenly, this work can be appreciated by any person who's ever seen the Mona Lisa. And beyond helping communicate science, the performing arts can also be useful in teaching, science, and engineering. As we all know, education is typically categorized into auditory, visual, uh, reading, writing, and the last one is kinesthetic. And as an engineer and as a student, I actually can, can relate that we've had very few kinesthetic experiences. So mostly I've had a lot of lectures, maybe an occasional lab uh, or prototyping. And while some argue that those lab times and prototyping is a kinesthetic skill, I can say otherwise. Kinesthetic learning requires your body as a canvas. It requires movement. And I believe that using dance to help teach biochemical disease, such as DNA replication, for example, can, can expand this field to new learners. And I believe this is important. And while not all of us may benefit from this type of learning, it does create a accessibility and more opportunities for students to be engaged in this way. And so these examples are noteworthy and important. But these examples are noteworthy and important. But the real way that we can blend this line of art and science is by a change in our collective consciousness. And this requires all of us, not just those who are classically trained as musicians or performers or hard, you know, famous engineers. It requires just all of us to open our minds to new ideas, to appreciate the work that other people are doing. Because as we've seen, all of us are artists and engineers. So together, we can make science and engineering more accessible, inclusive, and beautiful with the help of art. Thank you.